morning, everybody. Hopefully you had a wonderful uh, pre-holiday uh, weekend. So our speaking of holidays, our holiday hours on, uh, will be closed on both Monday and Tuesday of next week, giving uh, Trisha and Missy a well-deserved extra day off there. And then um, Monday, January 1st as well, obviously. So uh, everybody is, uh, you guys, I'm sure, taking off the 25th and the 1st, but um, we will also be taking off the 26th. So I'm sure some of you are doing as well. So uh, I saw this and I thought it would be a great uh, tool for you guys to use on HubSpot. Y'all know that I love HubSpot. A reengaging lost leads, a simple guide. So sometimes despite how interested they seem, we lose a lead. Now it could be lose a lead or it could also be lose a prospect, right? Where you've done a presentation and they ghost you. So when this happens, it can feel disheartening as you've uh, lost an opportunity to make a sale and generate revenue. So what is the strategy to get them back? So first thing you could do is you could survey leads you've lost. You could survey them on, you know, why did you discontinue? I'm, and the end, I'm gonna give you the tool we have at 5Q, which has worked highly effectively for two, two decades. But prior to that, I'm gonna give you other tools here that's via HubSpot that you can use. Now, one is the survey leads you've lost. Now, have we talked about a, a one survey questionnaire we could send to clients in the last few weeks? Yes. And I said you could use that to find out if they were loyal or not, and also to gather all sorts of information. But do you think that the question I asked there was the only time you could use that question? No, you can also use it <clears throat> with prospects that have deserted you. So you can actually use that one question survey for, for your clients to make them loyal, to find out what they want, to f find out how the winds are changing. But you can also use it to bring people back into the fold by asking them that question. Because if they answer that question, you get your ticket back in. Make sense? So the question was, if you could hire the world's smartest financial expert to solve just one financial problem, worry or frustration that people you like you face, what would that be? So you can also use this to try to bring people back into the fold. So does this sound like a hard sell one survey question you could sell to a process and to a prospect? Yes or no? Why or N? No, of course it's not. Yes. Straight marks deal. Now, will everybody send this back? No. But if one out of 10 send it back, that means one out of 10, you got engaged, re-engaged in conversation. So all these techniques I'm going to show you are not going to work with 100% of people. They probably work with only um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven percent of people. But if you use all of them, it's going to help you uh, re-engage those people that you otherwise lost. Use a trigger event to reconnect. What could those trigger events be? Well, Christmas could be one, right? What do you think a person would think about you if you sent them a, a prospect? If you sent them a handwritten Christmas card, not just a card with your signature on it. Guys, I'll give you a little hint. I left my bank, uh, this is like a couple of decades ago, but I left my bank. I left my bank because they sent me a Christmas card. You know, and I was sending them millions of dollars of business every year. We ran millions of dollars through them. You know, tens of millions of dollars to them every single year. And they sent me a, a Christmas card and all they did was sign their names. I left. Why did I leave, guys? Here's the funny thing. If they had not sent me a Christmas card, I probably would have stayed with them. But when they sent me a Christmas card with nothing but five signatures on it, what did it tell, the, the, tell me about their, their uh, belief or, or uh, about me? I hope you're kidding, Dale. What did it tell them if they sent me a Christmas card with five signatures? What did it tell, yeah, John, it told me that what? Uh, did they even, John, did they even uh, envision me in their head or were they handed a stack of cards and they went, sign, 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 sign. Did they even think about me when they signed that card? So at least if they had not even sent me a card, I wouldn't have thought, uh, thought anything of them. But when I got that sign, I said, you just say SOBs don't even give a crap. I send millions of dollars of business, tens of millions of dollars of business through your bank, and you don't even give a crap about me? So guys, what if you sent a Christmas card, not with your signature, or yes with your signature, but also with a note? I hope you know something about all your clients and know something about all your prospects you could put into a note saying, hey, I hope, uh, hope your trip to Hawaii went terrific. Thinking about you, you uh, have a merry, very merry Christmas. Now, here's the thing. 
What's the likelihood that their advisor actually sent a handwritten note, not just a, a friggin' card with a signature on it, but an actual handwritten note that they wrote? What's the likelihood that their advisor did that? So if you sent that to them, you've already done a 21 point checklist with them, you've already showed them an FIA, you've already, but they've deserted you, but now you send that card to them, they've not done a stitch of business with you, but the guy that has all their money doesn't bother. Could that re-engage them? Does that make them look at you differently? Yes. So that's one thing you could do. Could also do if, if Social Security is in the news. Hey, send them a, a send them a note about Social Security and let's get together and do a Social Security analysis for you. If there's an interest rate change and how that could affect them. If there's market downturn, if there's a big storms and how it pertains to their insurance, because do, do we have tools that we can help them with when it comes to the property casualty? A famous person dying and not having an estate in order a new product that's available, et cetera, et cetera. Find something that's in the news that you can then reach out to them and say, hey, uh, you probably saw this in the news, I have some information you might want, blah, blah, blah. Again, what's the likelihood their current advisor has contacted them about any of these things? No, their current advisor is what? Oh, we have an annual review or we have a semi-annual review with them. That's all they do. They, do they ever contact them because something's happening out there? So. This is another great way to connect and start a conversation. Share relevant content. So share things, uh, if you see a news story that you think they might find interesting, whether it has to do with finances directly or not, forward it to them with a little note. And, and you don't even need to send it in the mail, forward it to them via email with a little note saying, hey, I thought you'd find this of interest. Offer free incentives. We have DocuBank that you could offer them. And, and you can, Offer them from a ten to twenty-five dollars a membership for a whole year. That's a great, great little gift that you can give them, or give them a gift for a local um, uh, restaurant. Donate and uh, donate to charities, uh, and, and let them know that you're doing it in um, honor of all your clients. Offer them do digital will guys. How much? How how many of your advisors, and even how many attorneys are giving people digital wills? Do you think most or not most? Not most, and it costs you nothing to do this. Does anybody, does anybody not know what a digital will is? I'm not talking about your will online. What am I talking about with the digital will? Anybody not know what that means? Very good, you guys, John, Mark. It's about uh, pa making sure that all the social media, all the online, all the passwords that your appointed executor can access those accounts at your demise. And most don't, no, most attorneys still do not do this. And uh, uh, virtually zero advisors do this. So this is something that costs you nothing to give them. We have those tools on the site. And the legacy letter, what's the legacy letter? Legacy letter is about, uh, um, and again, this is a great tool you can use to approach your uh, local uh, uh, places of worship to offer free classes on, because it's about, it's a will that has to do with your morals, your lessons learned, the way that you view life that you want to pass on to your loved ones. So these are all things you can offer to people for free, right? Start the conversation in a new way. Reach out in a different way than you have been. If you normally call, uh, call them by phone, use a letter. If you normally use a letter, text them. If you, <laughs> if you normally text them, use a postcard or a funny postcard to get the conversation going. Or phone them if you normally don't phone them. Or email, so just reach out, skywriting. <laughs> Use some different methodology to get them to, to see what you're sending them. Again, don't send them text after text after text or email after email or email or phone after phone after phone call. Choose other medias to send uh, or to reach out to them. Make sense? Use, now here's the tool I want uh, to, uh, uh, I talked about earlier where I said uh, we have a tool for you and it's, it has started it works about 50% of the time so let me ask you a question let's say you went through the process with them and then they ghost it seemed like they were interested but then they ghost you why did they ghost you because they don't want your help on getting their power training to getting taken care of it's because they don't want your help on uh, you know, that property cash list is because they don't want those things. Why did they decide to desert you? 
Why did they stop the process? What have they decided in their mind? They wanted your help, they just did not want to move the what? Money. So the best way to get them reinvolved, again, this is the power of doing a 21 point checklist. If you're not doing 21 point checklist, you're missing the boat in a hundred, not 21 different ways, a hundred different ways because the 21 point checklist does so many things for you. One of the things it does is it allows you to, to get people who ghosted you to come back into the fold again. So what you do is you give them a call and you say, hey, uh, Don and Mary, I haven't heard from you. I'm assuming that you've decided to, to uh, keep the money where it's at. Hey, that makes total sense to me. You work for years and years and years, your blood, sweat, and tears to save that money. That's your uh, decision. So uh, that's cool. So keep the money where it's at. No problem. But as a, as a financial advisor, once I've identified problems and we saw, did we, we did see a problem with your power of attorney, we need to get that fixed. I'm ethically obligated to help you fix a problem once I've identified. So keep the money where it's at. It's not about the money, but please, 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 let's get back together. Let's take care of that power of attorney. It won't take but a half hour because now it's on my list. I've identified it. And if I don't help you with it, I'm not, I am not uh, 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 acting as a fiduciary. So please help me by letting me help you at least take care of the power of attorney. Then we'll shake hands. You go your way, keep the money where it's at. I'll go my way. At least then I know I've taken, I can check that off my, my uh, list and it will co won't cause me the anxiety that I'm, uh, it's causing me right, right now, not having that done for you. So keep the money where it's at. Come on in for a half an hour. Fix the power of attorney. Now, how many times did I tell them, keep the money where it's at? How many times did I tell them, keep the money where it's at? Once? Give me some answers, guys. How many times? I'm not looking for exact many. That's right. Many, 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 many. Is it clear to them that I, I keep the damn money where it's at? Is it clear to them <laughs> that I'm, I'm telling them keep the money where it's at? Yes. Now, here's the funny thing. When they come in for the power of attorney and you fix it, guess what they'll inevitably ask? Or not ask, I'm sorry. Guess what they'll inevitably do? They'll start to, after you've taken care of the power of attorney and you do not bring up the money, you do not bring it up, but they almost always, 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 99% of the time, they'll bring up the money and say, you know, and I, and I have to apologize. We decided to keep the money where it's at because blah, 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 blah. Once they tell you why they're keeping the money there, what's that allow you to do? Use our technique to overcome that objection. We tell them that their idea of why they want to keep their money there is absolutely right. We give them four or five or six or seven, seven reasons on why that's right. Then we start asking them questions for them to discover for themselves that, oh, it really isn't right. So we give you the techniques to do that. But now at least we've got that conversation going. Now let's say, again, uh, three, four, five, six percent of the time, that doesn't work. Then you say, well, while you're here, you know, we finished the power of attorney, but let's also get this other thing done. I don't have time today. Let's schedule another time to get this, uh, get your, um, uh, quality life directive to you, or you know, let's say whatever it may be, you know, get your, your titling done correctly or whatever, you know, whatever, whatever thing you want to choose. And hopefully you've written down what their hot buttons were so that they come back again. And I've never had somebody do this twice where they fixed one thing and then they set another appointment and then they fixed another thing that people didn't then engage them in a conversation about why they didn't decide to move forward. And once they've engaged you and you help them walk through their decision on staying where they're at, you're almost virtually guaranteed for them to move forward. Now, why would you be virtually guaranteed to move forward? Because what did you just do once or if necessary twice? Did you help them fix problems that you helped them identify that their advisor did not? Did you charge them for that? Did you hound them about money? No. So what do they know about you? That's right, Andre, value. What do they know about you? They, that's right, Dale, that you care about them. They do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. And we've talked about this before, guys. If there's two mechanics, one on the left-hand side of the road, one on the right-hand side of the road, they both can fix cars. So how do I make my decision about which mechanic I'm going to? It has nothing about their ability to fix cars. They both can fix cars. They wouldn't be in business if they can't. And that's the way they look at us as advisors. They know that no advisor is smarter than the other advisor because if they were, guess what? 
There'd only be one advisor in your town and everybody would go to them. They know that every advisor out there is, has about the same amount of knowledge and can produce about the same amount of results. The only thing they're worried about is what? What are they worried about when it comes to advisors? They're trying to find a smart advisor. Are they trying to find the one with the most degrees or the, the letters behind their names? They're trying to find the one that's going to give them the, you know, that has, that has cracked the code on giving them unbelievable age return. What are they looking for when it comes to an advisor? Period. What are they looking for? One thing and one thing only. What are they looking for? This one I want you to answer. I'm not moving forward to answer this because you need to understand this. Because this is where guy, advisors get all screwed up. They think clients are looking for a great financial genius. Guys, if there was a financial genius, guess what that would have happened a long time ago? Every other advisor in your town would be gone. There'd only be one guy with all the money. And they know their guy's not a financial genius. Why? Because he doesn't do any better than anybody else out there. They're looking for somebody they can trust. Somebody's going to put their own concerns above, uh, put their concerns above their own. That's what they're looking for. And when we do those two things, don't get paid for them. They're of value. Don't ask about the money. What do they know? That we care about them. Does that make sense? This is the best way to re-engage them, okay? If you've ever need to practice this conversation, get on my calendar. I will walk through it with you. We'll role play it over and over and over so that you get it down. So when you leave that phone message, uh, that um, it, it actually works or conveys what you're looking for. Because uh, I find that guys, advisors, have so much trouble saying more than once it's not about the money. And guys, at this point, is it really not about the money? No, it really is not about the money. I've showed them things that are wrong. For me, it's not about the money. Now what it's about is what? Providing value. As some, many of you have actually written down here. So at this point, I don't care about the money. I want to provide value. If I provide value, I know the money will come. So I don't worry. I'm not putting the cart before the horse. I know that if I provide value, they will give me the money. So I don't care about the money. That will happen naturally when they give me the opportunity to provide value to them or help them, right? Make sense? So today's topic, though, is about this dude, Charlie Munger. He passed away at, at age 99. Kind of an irascible old dude, but, but uh, many consider one of the best financial investors, stock investors uh, in history. So here's a question for you. Who is this guy? See how many of you get this right. Everybody give me an answer. Who is this guy? Getting lots of right answers. Yes, it's Warren Buffett. So I want to give you some of the uh, – we're going to end the coaching calls this year with some uh, 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 sage, different sage advice, uh, piece of sage advice that Warren Buffett has given throughout the years and how it can help us grow our business, be better people, et cetera. The first thing we need to know about is, is this guy was not born rich, but he was born a hard worker. He was selling chewing gum door to door at age 14 and had a net worth of 5,000 at age 14. So that is how many years ago? That's almost 100 years ago, guys, or not 100. It's almost 85 years ago, he had a net worth of $5,000. What was a net worth of $5,000 like 85 years ago? How would you like a net worth of five thousand dollars and uh yeah like fifty k at age fourteen and then he doubled it by age nineteen tenfold by twenty six I don't know how many fold by thirty four so obviously the longer you have the money and when you make money it it, it 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 you get an exponential curve we all know that but he he started out as a hard worker, but he didn't started out wealthy he built his wealth. From 34 to 67 to 376 to 620 to 1.4 billion, 3, 17, 36, 58, 70. And he's given a ton of money away during this time period as well. So we want to know how did he do this? And essentially, he was the same person age. His beliefs at 14 were almost identical with their, and this is only at age 87. I mean, what's he at now at 90, whatever? He's at what? Um, over 150 billion, I think. So let's look at, take, take a look at some of his philosophies. First of all, he's up at 6.45 a.m. and he reads at least six newspapers after waking up. He reads 500 pages uh, like this every day. 
That's how he builds up his uh, um, knowledge. With uh, he, he builds his knowledge is like compound interest that continues to build. Now, I am not capable of reading 500 pages a day, nor do nor do I think he's capable of reading 500 pages a day. He though he is looking at 500 pages a day and trying to absorb things that are the most important in each of those pages. But how many of us even look at 100 pages a day or 50 pages a day, a tenth of this? Hardly anybody. It's no wonder this guy is a walking encyclopedia on how to invest. I insist on a lot of time being spent almost every day to just sit and think. Now, I do do this. I, I, I've built this skill up where if I need an idea, I can sit in a chair, close my eyes, and let my brain roam. And that idea will come and go, come and go, come and go until I find one that will work. Sitting and thinking is, one of the, is, is what very, very few people do today. What does everybody want to do? If you're in line at the bank, if you're in line for getting a beer at a, at a, at a uh, festival, what is every friggin' person doing? They're looking at their friggin' phone. How many people take a walk? I mean, I, I walk my dog every day. How many people walking their dogs are talking on the phone or listening to a podcast or listening to music? How many people are walking without anything in their friggin' ears and just thinking? I mean, it, it, has anybody here read the biography of, of uh, Thomas Edison? Or is anybody here amazed at how these guys like Archimedes figured the thing out that they did before there was, you know, when they were using their fingers and toes to, to count numbers? What did these guys do all day? Go on social media, listen to podcasts, look at YouTube. What did they do all day? They did this. Thomas Jefferson used to walk and think. They contemplated, right? They thought, they thought, they thought. How many of you have an hour a day where you just sit without any interaction whatsoever? Turn off every friggin' thing and think. A lot of people say, you know, for years they say, Mike, how do you think of all these things? How do, how do you create all these things? How do, you, how do you come up with an idea? How do you overcome that? How do you do this? You know how I do it? <laughs> I sit down and what? Think. That is very uncommon in American business. Oh, amen. I read and think, so I do more reading and thinking and make less impulse decisions than most people in business. I do it because I like this kind of life. Warren Buffett during college discovered a book. Now, if it's, now let's talk about investing. Called The Intelligent Investor. Have I talked about The Intelligent Investor before? By Benjamin Graham. If you have not read this book, then you should not be advising people on stocks. By far the best book written on investing, uh, on investing ever written, Warren Buffett. He's not the only one that said this. Guys, <laughs> it, it, you have no business. You have no business advising people in stocks if you have not read this book. So really, there's two questions. I've said there's one question. What is the one question? If you want to find out whether an advisor should be advising clients or you want to ask, tell a client, here, ask your advisor this one question. They can't answer it. You need to leave them immediately. What's that question? Because this is the second question. What's the first question you need to have uh, ask to have your client ask their advisor? And if the advisor can't answer it, they need to leave them. What's that first question? How many of you? I've talked about this about three or four times. Uh, uh, Tom's got it. Talked about this about three or four times a year, every single year. Oh, come on, guys. Everybody pull out a pen and paper. Everybody pull out a big fat magic marker, a big fat magic marker and a piece of paper. And then as soon as you're done writing this, you need to tape it on your freaking wall. There's zero, there's zero reason for nobody to, to, for one person to have answered this correctly. You have your client ask their, their advisor, what they learn from long-term capital management. Everybody, I'm taking 30 seconds here, write that down. What did you learn from long-term capital management? Write it down. What did you learn from long-term capital management? 
Guys, I've talked about this a hundred times before. Long-term capital management was run by Merle and Shows, two, two Nobel Prize-winning prize economists, came up with an algorithm or a, the, the methodology to beat the market. They tested it over a hundred years, back tested it a hundred years. It worked great for three years and then crashed and took the world's markets down with it. The governments of Germany, Japan, the U.S. and Britain had to bail out all of the the um, Harvard, Stanford, uh, uh, Cal, the state of California pension, all, all and, and, and every other country, the same thing. All the institutional investors piled money into long-term capital management, and it worked till it didn't. Did it, again, magic marker, piece of paper, tape that. Guys, that's the first thing you need to ask. A, a, a client needs to ask, if, because if, if the uh, advisor doesn't know that, what have they not learned? If two Nobel Prize e economists who backtested at something that crushed the market every single year for 100 years, and then all of the due diligence, the, the, the best people in due diligence, because, uh, guys, when you're talking about huge uh, universities, huge corporations, huge states, government dumping money into an investment, they're doing their due diligence, and they're, 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 they're the best due diligence out there, and they still screwed up. What does that tell you about some advisor who thinks he can manage somebody's money if he doesn't even know the, the lesson learned by that? Now, the second question is, what's the one thing you've taken from the book The Intelligent Investor? If they can't answer those two questions, should they be managing people's money? No. Warren Buffett, investment philosophy. We talk about this in our FIA presentation. Number one, never lose money. Rule number two, never forget rule number one. If you invested one dollar and you lose fifty cents, you'll need to generate a hundred percent return on the remaining half just to break even. This is we use this almost exactly as said in our FIA presentation. Be prepared to lose half your money. Wait a minute, he told us that don't lose any money. Then he said be prepared to lose half your money. Why is he saying this? Because this is what a philosophy is. It, if you're going to be in stocks, are you going to lose money? Yes. What is he saying here? He's not saying that you're, you're, you're going to lose, you're, you, you can't lose money. He's saying the first thing you should think about when you invest is what? Safety or growth? The first thing, you, your number one priority when you think about investing in stocks is what? Safety or growth? If he's saying never lose money, is it about growth, guys? Never lose money. Is it about growth? No, it's about what? Safety. Safety, safety, safety. But even so, guess what? In the market, you better be prepared to lose half your money. How many of you ask this question of your clients? Because if you ain't, guess what? Are you being truthful with them? Lose money for the firm and I'll be understanding. Lose a shred of reputation for the firm and I'll be ruthless. So I love this. It's not about investing. This is about what? Reputation. It's about what? Being true, being honest, being forthright, following through, not lying. This is, this is so, so important for us in this industry because do people naturally like, uh, uh, trust us or naturally distrust us in this industry? Your reputation your reputation for providing value, providing honesty, following through, there's nothing more important than that. I don't care what kind of rate of return you can offer people. If you don't have a good reputation, it's not going to help you. Forecast may tell you a great deal about the forecaster. They'll tell you nothing about the future. So again, probably few people have been able to forecast better than Warren Buffett, but what does he say? Does he say that he has a crystal ball? No. Basically, his philosophy is this. Does he invest in stocks or does he invest in the US, uh, his space in the U.S. economy? He invests in his faith in the U.S. economy. He can create returns. The average person wants to make money quickly. There's no sure way to lose money quickly than to try to make it quickly.
Um, Jeff Bezos, I asked Warren, your style of investing is so simple. Why don't, doesn't everybody just copy you? Because nobody wants to get rich slowly. He invests in what? The next big, uh, the next big thing? Or does he invest in companies that he could care less what they do over the next month? He could care less what they do over the next year. He could even care less what they do over the next 10 years. He wants companies that are going to be successful over time. Only when the tide goes out do you discover who's been swimming naked. And guys, you've all experienced this with do-it-yourselfers. They think they're, and you know, do-it-yourselfers and your competition. They all think they're friggin' geniuses when the market's doing what? They all think they're friggin' geniuses when the market's doing what? Going up. Well, congratulations, Mr. Client, Mr. Do-it-yourselfer. Congratulations, Mr. Competitor. I know you think you're a genius. You know when you're when do you know a guy's a genius? When do you know a guy's a genius? When the tide goes out and what? Their boat's still floating. So if you show me somebody where the market got crushed and they're doing well, that's a genius. I you know I talk about the uh what's his face from um the big short, the the from the 2008 debacle, who was betting against, yeah, Burry, that's right, Mark Burry. So uh, that guy's a friggin' genius. Never invest in a business you cannot understand. I don't invest in Bitcoin, because I think Bitcoin's bad. No, why do I not invest in Bitcoin? Any client that would ever ask me, do I, should I invest in Bitcoin, i say, great, tell me exactly how it works. Tell me the advantages, tell me the disadvantages. And how many of your clients are going to be able to tell you that? If they can tell you that, tell them what? Invest in Bitcoin. If they can't tell you that, then you should say what? So if you look at my, my portfolio, I, I either buy individual stocks or uh, I buy um, indexes. But if you looked at my individual stocks, you, every single one of them, how many of them do you think you would recognize and be able to say what that company did? How many, well, let me put it differently. In my stock portfolio, how many companies do you think I own where you'd say, huh, I wonder what that company does? I follow <laughs> Buffett's uh, uh, recommendation. I don't invest in that company unless I know what that company does, and I use that product, and I've used that product, and I know I'm going to use, be using that product 10 years from now. Otherwise, it's in the S&P 500. I never attempt to make money in the stock market. I buy on the assumption that they could close the market the next day and not reopen it for five years. See, these are things you should all be going over with your clients that are in stock. Buy into a company because you want to own it, not because you want to own the stock or they want the stock to go up. Invest in the company because you want to own that company, not because you want the stock to go up. Market fluctuations are your friend, not your enemy. Huh, what's that? A, I, I, I tell you this all the time. Market fluctuations are not your friend, are your friend, not your enemy. Why do I say that, guys? Market fluctuations are your friend, not your enemy. Where did I just invest uh, uh, over a, a $1.2 million in the last month and a half? An FIA, right, Tom? Why did I invest in an FIA? Is there any, is there any investment that's been invented that works better with market fluctuations? None, zero, Zippo, it, that's right. It buy, automatically buys uh, low and sells high. And do I have to even, do, it, do any of my emotions get involved with that? Do I have to time the market or does it do it automatically for me? So basically he's describing what? An FIA. Now we're gonna come back to this too. Market fluctuation, your friend, and not your enemy. Because, we're gonna, well, I'll just ask it right now. Where has he stated that his wife should put all of her, all of the money when he dies into Berkshire Hathaway? Nope, 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 nope. Where has he said that his wife should put all of the money when he dies? I've talked about this many a time too. Thanks, John. Have a merry Christmas. Yep, in the index fund. The NOAA rule, predicting rain doesn't count. Building arcs do. Don't risk what is important to you to get what's not important to you. 
This is, again, great when it comes to your clients in retirement. If they made an extra 30% next year, would it affect them? No. If they lost 30% next year, would it affect them? Yes. Don't risk what's important to you, your lifestyle, to get what's not important to you, which is an extra money that you'll do nothing with. On the margin of safety, which means don't try and drive a 9,800-pound truck over a bridge that says it's going to hold 10,000 pounds. Go down the road and find one that will handle 15,000 pounds. Always have a, uh, a, a buffer of uh, safety. Again, why do we invest in the FIA? Does, how, what kind of buffer of safety does the FIA have? Huge. Where to put your wife's money when he, uh, when he dies? So let's just see. This is, a, this is a clip from him. Warren, a moment ago, you mentioned that you still are recommending that people invest in an S&P 500 index fund. Um, let me ask this question that came in from Kevin. He says, the last few weeks, we've been hearing from active money managers that the day of passing in, passive investing is over. The historical safety of investing in an index fund long term is gone. Would you please provide your thoughts on this topic? particularly in regards to an investment time span of 10 years? Well, I can tell you, I haven't changed my will. And, and it, it, it directs that my, my widow would uh, have 90% of the funds in index funds. And it's, it's, I think it's better advice than people are generally getting from people that are getting paid a lot to give other advice. You don't make a lot of money advising an S and P 500 index fund. I mean, that, and, and, uh, how you can say the day, day of index funds is over. I mean, here, if you, if you say the, the day of investing in America is over, I would disagree quite violently. And then is there something special about index funds being a terrible way to invest? Uh, I just don't think they really, it's very hard to have evidence of that. I mean, if, if the index funds reflect the market, uh, uh, and one side has high fees that, uh, that think they can pick out stocks, uh, and the other side has low fees. I know which side's going to win over time. And it's, you have to recognize that it's in, in a great many people's interest to convince you that they can do something that they may well even believe they can. And a certain percentage of them will do it from luck. And a few people will do it from skill, and that's what makes it so enticing that you can find the Jim Simons or somebody that's going to produce extraordinary return. Uh, and uh, Jim and his group have done it by, by brain power, but it's very unusual. And incidentally, they are going to charge you a lot of money, and they're going to actually maybe close up their fund uh, if they do it because they can't do it with you really huge amounts of money compared to what they've, how the record's been established in the past. So it's, you, know, you just have to recognize you're dealing with an industry where it pays to be a great salesperson and it pays even better if you're a great salesperson and you can actually produce something, but, but the money is in selling. The, the, there's a lot more money in selling than, than in managing actually, if you look to the essence of investment management. How many of you guys want uh, me to send this video to your money management clients? Everybody better answer this because if you don't, then I will send. If I don't get an answer, I will send it to your money management clients. Do you want me to send this to your money management clients? So I've got four people that answered. Yeah, Mark, I'd, I'd love to send it to Ken Fisher's clients. So am I telling you you shouldn't do money management? No. But I'm telling you, if you do money management, have a good story, charge a reasonable fee. And a few weeks ago, I showed you how you can charge a reasonable fee. Why? Because you wrap the, your money management fee in with the FIA fee. So you can basically, if you had a 50-50 portfolio, have your fee. Also, what's the only promises that you make when it comes to your money manager? When the market goes up, your accounts are going to go up. When the market goes down, your accounts are going to go down. And historically, markets go up more than they go down. Can I look somebody in the eye 
and and make those three statements with 100%. Would I bet my house on those statements? If I'm in a good money manager, would I bet my house on those statements? That when the, when the market goes up, you're going to go up. When the market goes down, you're going to go down. And historically, the market's gone up more than down. Hell yeah, I would bet my house on that. Would I now? Here's the thing. Here's what I hear a lot of people, the money manager, say. Now, okay, okay, I've got a money manager, and they they have excellent algorithms, and they have excellent expertise, and they have uh, number crunching, and the best investors in the uh, world. Now, here's the thing: you're not going to get all the returns. You might not have, you know, get all the returns when it goes up, but it's going to protect you on the downside, so you won't get hurt as bad. Would I bet my house on that? No, because have people that have made that promise had their funds blow up in their face? Yes, I will not bet my house on that. So guys, I'm not telling you to not to, to put all of your clients' monies. Uh, that's what I did. I put all my clients' monies into indexes, even though it was an RIA and I didn't make any money management fees. So I made all my income off of FIAs and I put their money into into indexes without getting any fees off of that. I'm not telling you to do that. That's what I did though. And I think I made a pretty good income doing that. But if you want to be a money manager, please, please, please charge reasonable fees and don't promise things you can't give them. Okay. Oops. What else happened? Here? How to save time and stop, stop, stop. Okay. Get back here. It's good to learn from your mistakes. It's better to learn from other people's mistakes. Guys, I send you this every two weeks. How do I help you do this every two weeks? How do I help you do this every two weeks? How do I help you do this every two weeks? Do, do I send you or does Trisha send you and then I talk, remind you about it every two weeks on coaching calls that we send you a snippet of an actual meeting where a guy has done something very well or done something very poorly and then I go over how they could be done better. Do I do that? If you're not using that, if you're not investing uh, two weeks, if you're not investing five to ten minutes of your time every two weeks, what does that tell you about your seriousness? about your business and getting better and making more money. It takes 20 years to build a reputation. Five, we just talked about this earlier. It's just a reiteration of 20 years to build a reputation, five minutes to ruin it. If you think about that, you'll do things differently. Be honest, provide value, follow through, do what you're going to say you're going to do. Don't make promises that you cannot uh, uh, guarantee. Excellent quotes by Warren Buffett. On earning, never depend on a single income, make investments to create a second source. Do we recommend that with money management and FIAs? Yes, on spending. If you buy uh, things you do not need, soon you will have to sell things you do need. On savings, do not save what is left after spending, but spend what is left after saving. On taking risk, never test the depth of the river with both feet. 50-50 portfolio, guys, 50-50 portfolio, money management, and FIAs, or even uh, even more. If you're afraid of rivers like I am, you're going to have even more into the FIAs. On investments, do not put all of your eggs in one basket. Again, guys, some money management, some in FIAs. On expectations, honesty is a very expensive gift. Do not expect it to, uh, uh, from cheap people. Are you being honest with your money management people and the promises you're making, or would you sell your, uh, uh, would you give them your house? for free if it did not perform the way you said it was going to perform. The most important investment you can make is in yourself. So guys, what should you be doing? We're not having any uh, meetings uh, or we're going to uh, not have a coaching call next week because it's uh, uh, Christmas and then we're not having a coaching call the following. That's, uh, that's because January 1st is on um, New Year's Day. So what should you be doing over the next two weeks, guys? If you're, if you're serious about your business, what could you be doing? over the next two weeks. Yes, 21 uh, practice, practicing the 21 mark. And do you, Mark, do you have to be perfect at, would I say you have to master the 21 point checklist? I would say, sure, yeah, absolutely do it. But what's the best way to master it? One at a time. So if you're gonna master 
uh, the script, what would be the first script I would tell you to master? Let's see, uh, at least make this goal. If nothing else, do this one goal between the next two weeks. And if you can't master a five minute script or a t uh, seven minute script in the next two weeks, uh, we, we gotta talk. <laughs> we gotta talk. Ah, Mark's got it right. Tom's got it right. Nick's got it right. What's the most important script? What's the f script that it, within the first 10 minutes will let a client know that they have a problem they did not know they had? Not because you said they have a problem, because it's right there in black and white, and it's something that could cause huge problems for them going forward, especially the wife. I only got three right answers so far. Power of attorney, that's right. Power of attorney, power of attorney, power of attorney. Mark says he, he's dealing with someone right now with the, the, with the, uh, 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 issue right now, even though they had a legally, uh, uh, perfectly legal power of attorney, it does not matter. So, yeah, with Schwab, exactly. It is not only the problem with, with, with um, Social Security and Medicare, it's also a problem with many, many, many brokerages. But, uh, so guys, please, please, please use the next two weeks, get better at your skills, start every other week at least when we send you those tape reviews. It's only a 10 minute uh, investment. Those of you that really want to be looking at a million dollar, two million dollar income over the next 2024 should be doing what every day? The 15 minute drill. Again, invest. If, <laughs> if I went out on the street and said, hey, if, I, if you invested, if I could get you to do something for 15 minutes a day, you can make a million dollars next year. How many person would say, yeah, sign me up? I'm telling you that if you do the 15 minute drill every day, that with, by the end of the year, you'll be on track to be making a million dollars a year the following year. If you've been doing it, all, if you've been doing the 50 minute drill every single day in 2023, guess what you're going to make in 2024? And if you've been doing the 15 minute drill every single day and you're, and you're not on track to make a million dollars a year, here's a good question for you. What should you be doing? Well, what I highly recommend you do, if you've been doing the 15 minute drill every single day, and you're not on track to make a million dollars starting in, uh, starting January 1st, what should you do? Ah, Nick's got it. Tom's got it. Call me. If you've invested 15 minutes, just 15 minutes a day in yourself, and you're not seeing results, I will bend over backwards to make sure 2024 that you blow the doors off. But if you've been doing a 15 minute drill, how, how quickly would I be able to tell if you've been doing a 15 minute drill every day or not, if you're yanking my leg? Because what would your skill level be right now if you were doing a 15 minute drill every day? Would I be able to tell that if you did 15 minute drill every day for the last year and I talked to you and I, you know, we did, I, I had to do a couple of uh, scripts or we did some role playing, how quickly would I be able to tell that you had or had not been doing the 15 minute drill? So please guys, this of all the slides I've shown you today, there's lots of great slides in there, lots of important slides in there. This is the most important slide. The most important investment you can make is in yourself. Make sense? So reminder, we're closed on Monday and Tuesday of next week, January 1st, then we're gonna hit it hard for the next year. I know I've yelled and screamed at you today. It's because I love you. I want to thank you all for sticking with 5Q. I really appreciate you. The reason I'm young is you have the, you have the genie in a bottle. Take the time to rub that bottle. Rub that lamp. Release the genie for 2024. We really appreciate you. We're here to help you. Please invest in yourself. You guys have a fantastic holiday. Uh, um, season. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. I think we're already in, in that. The, uh, however you celebrate, I hope you and your family do it wonderfully, happily, and we will talk to you all in a couple of next weeks. Thank you, guys. I uh, appreciate you all very, very much. Bye-bye.